Hello, and welcome to Dining with Death, where we discuss infamous cases of death and murder that have an element of food to them, and then we cook the food from the case. I'm Stacy Lee. Let's begin. On Monday, December 16th, 1985, Paul Castellano, the boss of the Gambino crime family, was driven to the curb of Sparks Steakhouse in Midtown Manhattan on East 46th Street near 3rd Avenue. As he stepped out of the car and onto the sidewalk, he was gunned down in a hail of bullets as he exited the passenger side of his black Lincoln Town car. Paul Castellano, also known as Big Polly, succeeded Carlo Gambino as the head of the Gambino crime family. He was a giant man standing at about six foot three inches tall and weighing in at around 270 pounds. And I don't think it was all muscle. I think it's safe to say he liked to eat, don't we all? He was born in Brooklyn in 1915 to Italian immigrants Giuseppe Castellano and Conchetta Castao. I hope I'm saying that right. He dropped out of school in the eighth grade to learn butchering and follow in the footsteps of his father. He quickly became involved in petty crime and gambling, kind of a street kid. Um, in 1926, his sister Catherine married the future mafia boss Carlo Gambino. And in 1937, Castellano married his childhood sweetheart Nina Mano. In the early 1940s, Castellano became a member of the Mangano family and became a couple under boss Albert Anastasia. Castellano became more of a businessman, even though he had kind of started out as a street kid and kind of a hood. And he started Dial Poultry, which is a poultry division business that once supplied over 300 butchers in New York City. So it was a significant um, supplier of meat in that area. He was also involved in the concrete business, which is something I always associate with the mafia in New York. Maybe I've watched too many movies. Castellano was known as a businessman, but he was also known as being extremely brutal. In 1975, he allegedly had Vito Borelli, the boyfriend of his own daughter, murdered because he heard Borelli had compared him to Frank Perdue. Frank Perdue was the owner and commercial spokesperson of Perdue Farms, which was also a chicken supplier. Purdue was a little bit of a goofy looking guy. I guess that's not so nice, but I mean, you can see for yourself. And Castellano was apparently so insulted by this comparison <laughs> that he had the guy who made it killed. You know, like we would all like to at some point in time, but we don't. Things took a turn in Paul Castellano's life when on October 17th, 1976, Carlo Gambino, head of the family, died at home of natural causes. And even though Gambino was not expected to appoint Castellano to succeed him, that is ultimately who he chose. The underboss, Agnanello Neil Della Croce, I really hope I'm saying all of these names right. Underboss Agnanello Neil Della Croce was next in line, but he was in prison at the time for tax evasion and he was unable to do anything to contest the appointment of Castellano as the next mob boss. As boss, Castellano created an alliance with the Cherry Hill Gambinos, who were a group of Sicilian heroin importers and distributors in New Jersey, and he also liked to use them as gunmen when there was a hit to be taken out. In 1981, at the height of his power, Castellano built a lavish 17-room mansion on a ridge line in Tot Hill, Staten Island. It was designed to resemble the White House, and you can see here, that was a hell of a house. John Gotti, then a lower-ranking mobster underneath Castellano, became dissatisfied with Castellano's leadership and felt that the new boss had become too isolated and too greedy. Gotti also wanted to expand the drug dealing portion of their business and Castellano had forbidden this. So Gotti remained close with underboss Della Croce even though he hadn't been appointed. And then when Della Croce died of cancer, it began a chain of events that would eventually lead to the event we're discussing today, Paul Castellano's murder. Several factors contributed to the conspiracy to kill Castellano. His failure to attend Della Croce's wake was an insult to the Della Croce family and his followers. And secondly, Castellano named his bodyguard and driver Thomas Bellotti as his new underboss. Bellotti was a bullish loan shark type of a guy with little diplomatic skill, something that was viewed as very necessary to be an underboss. Castellano also hinted that he wanted to break up John Gotti's crew as they were getting too powerful. And this information got back to John Gotti and his hitman Sammy the Bull Gravano then suggested killing Castellano and Bellotti while they were eating breakfast at a diner. 
Uh, Gotti was tipped off that Castellano would be having a meeting with several other Gambino mobsters at Sparks Steakhouse on December 16th. Gotti and other conspirators decided to kill him then. Years later, Infia Mafia hitman Richard Kuklinski, also known as the Iceman, claimed to have carried out the murder of Paul Castellano, but witnesses testified to four gunmen being present. It is not known if Kuklinski was among these gunmen, but if you know anything about the Iceman, he did plenty. He doesn't need to claim this one too, he's, he's good. After the feds got a round of indictments for various crimes against the mob, Sammy the Bull Gravano, John Gotti's uh, kind of right-hand man, eventually turned state witness testifying against his boss on many criminal acts. On the murder of Castellano, he testified that not only was he himself present at the murder, but so was his boss, John Gotti. He testified to a federal jury in Brooklyn and gave his eyewitness account in which he says, we were sitting at this scene, we were looking down at Sparks Steakhouse, a car drew up alongside us and stopped for a red light. Sammy the Bull recalled that it was Mr. Castellano in a Lincoln being driven by Bellotti. Gravano said, I just turned and I told John, they're right next to us, and he used a walkie-talkie to notify the gunman up ahead that they were stopped at the light and would be coming through. When the light turns, the car with Mr. Castellano drove across 3rd Avenue and parked in front of Sparks Steakhouse. Gravano then continued to relay that waiting for the two men were four gunmen wearing white trench coats and black Russian hats. Okay. The gunman ran over to them and started shooting, and Gravano said Castellano was shot first, and his driver, Bellotti, was getting out of the car when somebody came up behind him and shot him. Although the mob is known for killing people that get in their way, it's almost unheard of to kill a boss. John Gotti had effectively done the unthinkable when he ordered this hit to be taken out on Castellano. Although Paul Castellano never made it to the table for his last meal, he was known to eat at Sparks Steakhouse regularly, and he was a big fan of their steaks. I actually called there, it was during COVID, so it was tough to kind of nail anybody down. There was a lot going on. My little dog and pony show here wasn't a priority, but I think I've kind of got an idea of one of the things he likes to order. The menu boasts steakhouse classics of smoked salmon and capers and shrimp cocktail appetizers along with oysters and baked clams. They have classic salads and sides like cream spinach, mushroom caps, and even hash browns. Extra thick veal chop, beef scallopini, and steak fromage are some of the entrees along with lobster tails, halibut, and red snapper. They have an impressive wine list and cheesecake and other classic desserts. So stay with me because next we're gonna cook what very well could have been Paul Castellano's last meal as we go dining with death. All right, we are ready to cook. We are going to start out with a filet, Sparks Steakhouse style. So it's going to have some red peppers on it that have been marinated in oil. We're gonna do some mushroom caps that have a little bit of garlic and butter, a little bit of seasoning. We're gonna do some nice bright asparagus. Now, I know some of you out there are cremating your asparagus because that's how you were taught that it was supposed to be, but no, asparagus should be nice and crispy and bright and not super heavily seasoned because it's kind of the thing that cuts through the richness of a meal like this. And then I'm gonna show you how to get a perfect steakhouse baked potato. All baked potatoes are not created equally. Do not give me a baked potato that's been in the microwave. <laughs> Maybe it is the Irish in me, I don't know, but baked potatoes can be great or they can be so-so, and we're gonna make a great one today. First things first, we are going to poke some holes in the skin. You don't have to use a knife this big, but this just happens to be right here, so. This is just kind of for piercing the skin. Then we are going to take some melted butter and we're gonna brush both sides of the potato. And then we're gonna season them pretty heavily with kosher salt. And when I say season things, I mean season things. You know, you see these people that go like this with a pinch. I don't know who that pinch is for because nobody's tasting that, so season. These are gonna go in the oven for about 25 minutes, and then we're gonna brush them with butter again so we get that extra crispy, nice skin that everybody likes. Okay, we are gonna blaze through this next part because it's a lot of information. We have to make a demi-gloss for our steak, but before we can do that, we need to make one of the mother sauces, espanol. So the espanol becomes the demi-gloss. You're gonna finely dice a quarter cup of carrots, a quarter cup of celery, and then into a small dice, a half a cup of onion. 
and you're going to tie up in a piece of cloth or a sachet, two bay leaves, a half a teaspoon of thyme, eight peppercorns, and some fresh parsley. Put some butter in a pan. You're gonna add your mirepoix. You're gonna let that soften and caramelize. Then add two tablespoons of flour to make a roux. And you're gonna add two cups of beef stock and a couple tablespoons of tomato paste. Give that a whisk. Add your tied up herbs and let that reduce by half. And you're gonna strain that after you remove the sachet. That stuff that comes out of there, stir it all around and that is delicious. That's the cook's meal in the restaurants usually over a piece of toast. Don't throw that away. Then to make your demi glace, you take Half a teaspoon of thyme, eight peppercorns, some bay leaf, fresh parsley, make another sachet. Your two cups of espagnole, two cups of beef stock, give that a whisk, throw your herbs in there, and again let it reduce by half. Remove your herbs, strain it, and that is your beautiful demi-gloss. You can also pour this into silicone molds and freeze it so you have it whenever you need it. Just throw it in a pan with a piece of meat. I've got a nice bowl of big white mushroom caps here. All I've done is wash them really good and then remove the stems. Uh, a lot of times I would slice these up to put them on a steak, but at Spark Steakhouse, they serve them whole, whole mushroom caps, and we're trying to be as close to their uh, version of the dish as we can, and they serve them whole. So we are just going to get ready to saute these in a little bit of garlic and a little bit of butter, maybe some salt and pepper. I've got a nice little bunch of asparagus here. I live in kind of a smaller town. Sometimes my options are kind of limited. But when you are looking for asparagus, you want a thin spear that has a closed tip because if the tips are open, that means they're old and dried out. What are you saying about me? Anyway, you want them thin and tight. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Get your asparagus spears that are young and thin and tight and juicy. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> Always cut the ends off your asparagus because when they come from the grocery store, they're kind of dry on the bottom. So just give them a little bit of a chop. These ones are already a little bit short, so I'm not gonna do much to them. Okay. We're just gonna cook these really simply, saute them over high heat in a little bit of butter, and they're gonna stay bright and crisp and really kind of help us to cut through, give us kind of a vegetal crunch uh, where we've got a lot of rich stuff going on. So that'll be a nice addition. I've got a nice piece of filet here from my local butcher. The photo that Spark Steakhouse shows as their filet is like this big. So I'm a little bit confused. I don't know if it's maybe mislabeled or, or what, but filets are not usually that large. So I'm gonna stick with what I know. Um, I'm gonna cut this guy I got about, I think this is about 12 ounces, and fillets normally come in eight or 12 ounce portions. Sometimes you can get them a little bit different than that, but um, I'm gonna keep this pretty thick. I just kind of got a little extra piece. And get rid of that string that kind of holds it all together there. I think I'm gonna keep this kind of fat, but not this fat, um, about here, I believe. we've got a really nice filet um, ready to go. Now, there are people that will argue about whether or not this makes any difference, but I have always been taught that a steak needs to sit out for 15 or 20 minutes before you get ready to cook it. If it comes right out of the refrigerator, um, I don't know, I'm not really sure 100% what the theories are. I know that some people feel like the fat is too cold. I know some people feel like the muscle hasn't had a chance to relax. There are different theories, but I've just always been taught to leave it out and it works for me. So I leave it out for about 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, after our steak has been out of the refrigerator for 15 or 20 minutes, we're gonna season it. And again, when I say season, I mean season. <laughs> not like this, like this. You're gonna really heavily salt that almost a crust of salt. And 
and I do it on all sides. And I worked for a chef that got really upset if you wasted seasonings. So you always roll your thing around and pick up the extra salt. No need to be wasteful, right? Put some black pepper on that. I don't know where my big pepper grinder is, but this one works. Give a little pat. Give a little pat. Everybody likes a little pat. Okay, into a medium hot pan for the asparagus. We're going to put some butter. We're gonna put just a drizzle of olive oil. Olive oil has a higher smoking point than butter does, so when you mix them together, it gives you kind of the nice rich flavor of butter with a little bit more forgiveness on how hot you can actually get things because the butter will burn. I'm just gonna drop our asparagus in. Now I will freely admit I do not like my asparagus cooked as much as most people do. So if this isn't long enough for you, that's okay. You make it the way you like it, but for me, it's just a couple of minutes. After you let them sit for maybe a minute or so, on one side, just kind of toss them in the butter. This is kind of a butter heavy meal, so you're not gonna hear me complaining. <laughs> we do have a lot of salt going on in this meal, so I'm gonna salt this really, really lightly, just to give it a little bit of flavor. And I'm gonna give it some fresh ground pepper because when do you not? Okay, it's been maybe five minutes and that's plenty done for me. So, if you like them a little bit more done than this, that's okay. But this is good for me, so let's pull these off. Okay, while our pan is still nice and hot, all of these little brown bits left from the asparagus or if it's meat or whatever it is that you've cooked, there's a ton of flavor there. It's called fond. And you always wanna deglaze with either wine or beer or uh, stock, some kind of liquid, so you can pick up all of that flavor off the bottom of the pan. So I'm gonna use a little white wine. I'm gonna put a little bit of garlic in there. And we're gonna let our mushrooms start to cook. As mushrooms cook, they release a lot of liquid. So I think in this method where you're doing them in a little bit of wine and a little bit of liquid, the best thing to do is let them kind of cook and let all of that liquid kind of come out. And then the liquid will begin to evaporate and that's when we can add a little bit of butter and get kind of a nice caramelization on the outside of the mushrooms. But before we can do that, they have to cook down and they have to release their liquids. Okay, most of the liquid has cooked down and uh, now we're gonna caramelize the mushrooms by adding just a little piece of butter. This is kind of an old school way of doing mushrooms, the old uh, like 70s and 80s steakhouses. But in the photos, it looks like this is still the way Sparks does their mushrooms, and there's a reason for that. They're delicious. The garlic has become very soft and sweet and fragrant, and the wine has reduced down. And as you can see, the butter, the fat, has started to caramelize the tops of the mushrooms and give them a nice color. I think I'm gonna go ahead and take these off because the garlic is starting to get a little brown, and you don't ever want it to get past this stage because burnt garlic has a very unpleasant, acrid flavor. So never get it more than just nice and toasty golden brown. Okay, it's time for the steak. You will never hear me say there's only one right way to do something right. If it works and it's the best version of what it can be, then it's a right way. Now don't get me wrong, there are wrong ways to do things in the kitchen, but that doesn't always mean there's only one right way. You'll hear people argue to the death about how to do a steak the right way. Well, in my opinion, this is the right way to do a steak. You get a cast iron pan smoking hot. I have turned off the fire alarms in my house. 
because this is gonna get smoky. Our steak has been sitting out for about 30 minutes. Cold butter into the pan. Here we go, very hot pan. Do not touch it and let that nice crust form. Let's give it a flip. Beautiful. I like my steaks medium rare on the rarer side. If you like your steaks well done, have a nice day. Steaks should not be served well done. Okay, both sides are nicely seared and we're going into a 500 degree oven for probably three or four minutes and then we'll check it. Okay, let's plate this up. Perfect baked potato, Ooh, it's hot. Listen, can you hear that? Can you hear that? That's what a baked potato should sound like. I've got some fresh chives out of my mom's garden. All right, let's put down some of the demi-gloss from earlier. Oh, yeah. Our beautiful steak. That has rested. Always, always, always have to let a steak rest. Never ever cut into it while it's still right out of the oven, at least five minutes. Some people say longer than that. And then here is what makes the Sparks Steakhouse steak a little different, these red peppers. I think I'm only gonna do one because my steak is so much smaller, but here you have it. Obviously, you know I'm going to taste the steak first. Wow, that is really, really good. There's just nothing like a steak cooked in a cast iron pan. You got that nice crust on the outside. It's salty, it's rich. Um, it's a little bit fatty, and then if you have a good piece of steak, it kind of has that really nice marbled, um, meaty texture that is dry in a good way, crumbly in a good way. It's delicious. I want to take a bite of it with um, this little red pepper thing they got going here. Mm. Yeah, it's good. Um, I'm kind of a steak purist. I don't want my steak wrapped in bacon. I don't want my steak to taste like bacon. I don't really want my steak to taste like blue cheese, although I do like blue cheese. I just like my steak to taste like steak. This baked potato, come on now. Sometimes the simplest things are the best, right? It's fluffy, it's soft. And when they're baked in the oven and done really well, they're a little bit waxy in a really good way. You know what I mean? Mm. It's absolutely delicious. Let's try one of these mushrooms. Wow. Those are really good. Um, I'm Like I said, normally would slice my mushrooms up, but this might be my new way of doing them. They're really meaty and you can really taste um, all of the deliciousness left over from the wine. Not an alcohol flavor, but just that tangy, bright, um, a little bit earthy flavor of the white wine and then, you know, mixed with the earthiness of the mushrooms. It's just delicious. There's a little bit of garlic, there's a little bit of salt. Let's get a little asparagus. 
that's just what this needs it needs something that's bright it needs something that's fresh it needs something that's um, a little bit crunchy to go with all of this because it's a very rich meal it's a very very rich meal well probably not exactly like spark steakhouse if i did anything wrong let me know i'll try to do better next time if you've got any comments feel free to comment i think we did a pretty good job recreating what very well could have been paul castellano's last meal today as we went dining with death thank you so much for joining me please stay safe and have a wonderful day like and subscribe if you would like to see more Bye.